And here we are at our final talk. Okay, so um, first up in this discussion. So we've talked about how Billy, he he's sort of a <laughs> victim of his own experience. He's sort of a passenger in his own life, like a little homunculus riding around in his own head, um, watching things through the windows of his eyes. But does he ever in the story exercise his own free will? This is kind of a memory question. <laughs> Cause I mean, I think that there's one place where we might be able to argue that he does. Anybody? And I don't know if it's going to come up actually uh, in one of the other questions, but I, I figured I'd mention it. I might have mentioned it before, but it has been tickling my brain lately. But I think uh, perhaps uh, when he thought about his uh, experience in Tranfel Mordorian. When he thinks about it? He thought about that. Uh, it was. It was. Oh, uh, when he talks about he it, will to go to this station to. Yes. Yes. Good. That's what I was thinking. That's the only time I can really think that he does something that seems to give him any sort of agency <laughs> of his own. By agency, I mean, if you guys aren't familiar with that use of the term agency, I mean. With, like free will, basically free will agency. Um, yeah, he sneaks out, right? It says that he sneaks out when he gets back from the hospital. He has, uh, he has a, a nurse that's there to watch him at home, but he has to sneak out past her. Um, and he sneaks to New York and he finds the Kilgore Trout stories in the dirty magazines in the adult bookstore <laughs> and goes on to the radio station. Yeah. I really can't think of anything else. And this is the other thing that's been bothering me. Well, not bothering me, but it's just been on my mind. Um, and I did, I, I'm sure I've mentioned it before, but even when he has memories or time jumps that go back to his childhood, He's already in that passive state, isn't he? I mean, like he has a memory. The first time jump that he has in the whole book is first or second is when he <laughs> he flashes back to his early childhood and his father throws him into the pool and he sinks to the bottom. <laughs> the father's so like, you, you're going to learn to swim. For him, uh was uh, uh, it was a uh, so bad experience that uh, he thought he uh, uh, become crazy because of that not because of uh, because of the war yeah well that's the question isn't it because um i don't know I, it's it's a tough one uh it seems like the war trauma the you know horrible sights of war, the horrible things that you would see. And they just, uh, I mean, even on a just basic, uh, you know, physical level and like uh, physiological level, the constant, you know, adrenaline and loud sounds that make people jump, uh, those things are enough to cause, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder especially when it's a life and death situation, you hear a loud sound and it could be the end for you or your friends. I don't know how to stop this. <laughs> so the only way to get rid of temptation is to give in. <laughs> I don't know Answer. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know because it's, okay. it's a computer. It's okay. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the Skype sound or... It's all right. Maybe somebody is calling on Skype. <laughs> I will block my. Uh... Aha! You did it. Some of the. Uh, I will send a message not to call me. 
Okie doke. Um, so yeah, I mean, I hear what you're saying and I had considered that like maybe the trauma is being thrown into the pool, but it seems a bit over the top to have that. I, I mean, who am I to judge honestly, but <laughs> that all of this is the tra traumatic reaction to being thrown into the pool. It seems like the trauma of war would be the heavier, more deeply affecting one. I don't know, but it's a fair question and it's a, it's a, a possibility but even you know the fact like okay what is the moment that he becomes that passive because he's already like that it seems like when he's thrown in is it the act of being thrown into the pool that turns him into a passive you know just victim of his own experience because it says that he remembers someone jumping in to save him and he feels annoyed that somebody jumped into the water to save him. He was in delirium. Yeah, I know. It seems a little over the top, though, to have that much trauma, but some people are really sensitive. Hey, look, I was a sensitive kid, for sure. <laughs> um, the other traumas from his childhood are also there when his when they go on vacation and they go to the Grand Canyon and uh, was he's, afraid to he, uh, jump uh, from this great uh, height from the great height yes right. yeah, he was afraid of the heights um, <laughs> there's a lot that one could say about that fear of heights thing did you want to say something Sonia no, I'm just, <laughs> I have allergies and then it's, <laughs> uh, okay. and then sometimes I start coughing and then, <laughs> yeah, it's difficult. <laughs> I gotcha. Um, yeah, that fear of heights thing. Uh, there, are, okay. <laughs> I don't want to swim too far from the shore here, but there's been some decent writing about that in, uh, philosophy and like amongst the so I have a bit of a fondness for sort of the existentialists right and I think it was Sartre who was saying that uh, it's that fear of freedom when you're up in a high place that's the real fear because there's nothing stopping you <laughs> that's where the fear comes from it's not the actual height or you know that you're worried something will happen the fear is that you're confronted with the fact that nothing is stopping you from <laughs> from from jumping. Anyway, that's kind of off topic. <clears throat> His father kicks a stone down. Billy's father kicks a stone down into the canyon. Um, and there's another, what's that cavern? Carlsbad Caverns, is it? That, that's also on the same trip. The underground caves, the pitch blackness, right? They go into the dark cave and the tour guide says, most people have never experienced true darkness. Um, so those three things happen in his early childhood <clears throat> and could constitute some kind of trauma that, I don't know, maybe set the course for him to be more sensitive and be more affected by his wartime traumas um, or something like that. I don't know. But yeah, going to the radio station was the time that he... Uh, he stood up and, and uh, became a character. Uh, at some point, Vonnegut in the novel says, there are no characters in this, in this story. Um, and there's only one point where Edgar gets up and, and becomes a character. And he becomes a character by standing up to uh, Howard Campbell, the American Nazi recruiter. And that's what he means by a character, somebody who takes responsibility for their actions, at least for a moment. But Billy generally doesn't do that. Hmm. It's hard to figure out how to, to frame Billy then, you know. In a way, we are Billy while we're reading the story <laughs> because we're just watching the story go by. Can I say how I... Uh see Billy in this story. Sure, please do. Um, I see that uh, books from uh, Kilgore Trout are some kind of MacGuffin. Some because, kind of MacGuffin, okay. Because they uh, drive the story 
and uh, motivate uh, Billy to for his actions. Uh, just for everybody, a MacGuffin, if you're not familiar with that term, is a kind of plot device that the, the thing that moves things forward. It's kind of a, I'm trying to remember the first, where the term came from. Uh, I usually know it, but I can't think of it right now. Um, sure. It's uh, usually used in film uh, and right. movie than in books. Yeah, there's the MacGuffin. Uh, is that the same thing as unobtainium? Like that's what people say these days. The thing you can't get in the film <laughs> and you have to get it. So they're like, we have to get the thing and it's called unobtainium because <laughs> you can't obtain it. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, um, hmm. I'd have to think about that a bit. I'm not sure if I would, if I would call the, the Kilgore Trout books the MacGuffin. I mean, hmm. Because Billy doesn't have any goals. <laughs> That's the problem, <laughs> you know? But uh, this uh, book uh, made him think uh, uh, that he lived in those books and right. uh, believe uh, uh, things are going uh, as a plot uh, uh, that is made, uh, especially in the gospel from outer space. Especially, especially in that one, really, because that I would say especially in the board, but but the OK, go on, though. Uh, that's interesting uh, because uh, um, uh, in this book, uh, there is a visitor from outer space mm -hmm. and he studied Christianity and mm -hmm. why uh, Christians are so cruel. cruel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the uh, gospels uh, supposed to uh, make people merciful, uh, especially to the people that are not uh, strong. Sure. But uh, in the contrary, gospels uh, says uh, send the wrong messages to people. Right. Uh, there is the right guy to crucify. The, uh, yes, yeah. uh, they said that the uh, wrong guy was crucified. He was uh, somebody that is well connected mm -hmm. and with uh, the most powerful guy in the cosmos. So right. uh, so the message is uh, when you kill somebody, There's uh, a right you guy. have to think uh, about uh, uh, him. Is he well connected or not? Right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they, uh, they uh, send the new gospel because of that, this uh, guy from outer space, mm -hmm. and uh, make uh, some new Jesus that is nobody. Yeah. And people crucified him because uh, they think that uh, will no be repercussion uh, because he's nobody. No, and, I remember the story. Uh, this, I, I uh, only to say that uh, this uh, guy, uh that is uh, nobody in this mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. this uh, willy is uh, something yeah. uh, 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 is something parallel with this jesus that is nobody because mm -hmm. okay. uh, willy uh, uh, he, he has some rituals uh, when he was young to be crucified uh, on the door of his uh, room and uh, when he was in the car and nobody want uh, to be uh, near him, uh, he was uh, uh, sleeping, standing. And when the door opened, he was crucified on the corner of the, of the uh, box, uh, of, the, of this, uh, this uh, I don't know how, how it is called this. Um, I'm trying to remember this part. Um, train, yes. So uh, I think uh, that uh, there is connection between them and uh, those Trafalman Dorians uh, mm -hmm. knows a uh, fourth dimension. Yeah. And this is something that uh, a string theory uh, predict that it is possible to Sure. Uh, connect uh, distant point uh, uh, from time through wormhole. 
and this right. uh, this uh, distant uh, uh, spooky action at a distance this uh, uh, civilization that is uh, more advanced uh, uh, knew those things and can present some uh, god civilization <clears throat> because they uh, in one point uh, made uh, uh, the end of universe mm -hmm. uh, with some uh, yeah they blew their they blew up the universe testing out a new yes, engine with some start <clears throat> button yes Okay, okay, that's uh, quite a lot <laughs> for us to digest. Let's take it step by step. <laughs> um, okay, about the MacGuffin thing. Um, it's a complicated question, I think. So uh, a MacGuffin should advance, okay, that, that's a reference to the story, uh, uh, not style, but uh, technique, yeah. A way of forwarding the story. I don't know. I don't know if I would totally accept that. Um, I mean, I can see that there's definitely reflections. Uh, and it's interesting that you chose the gospel from outer space as the one, because I think the one that most reflects Billy's experience is the board, the big board, that story. Because in the big board, uh, a couple of earthlings are kidnapped and put into a zoo. <laughs> and Yes. They're given a big board to look at with all the stock prices, and they're told that they've had a million dollars invested for them so that they can be watched for their emotional reactions and so on. Um, all books are uh, McGuffin, but they choose this because uh, there is connection with uh, uh, Jesus Christ. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to think through the connection to Billy's... Uh, Helplessness. I mean, I think this is going to relate to another question that's coming up in a bit in this presentation, because uh, there's a question of why Billy doesn't find comfort in his religion. I put it in one of these cards. Um, because there's the implication that he does at some point, and then he loses it. Uh, because, I mean, he is the assistant chaplain. But anyway, we'll get to that <clears throat> shortly. Um, I wanted to talk about Billy's death scene. Uh, a little bit more. Um, why might it be described in the way that it is? And I put the text up on the next slides so we can remember what it is uh, that happens in Billy's death scene. Um, so Billy says, now this is the way he's going to die. Uh, did I skip one? Oh, no, I didn't. Uh -huh. As a time traveler, he's seen his own death many times, has described it to a tape recorder. It's the interesting thing is it's uh, we get lost as to what our our Billy is supposed to be uh, because this is referred to as the future. Um, so where are we? <laughs> I don't know if I'm explaining my concern there properly uh, because Billy's death is in the future, right? Even though he's a time traveler who jumps around. <clears throat> I mean, I guess. Uh, we could never jump to Billy after his death. It wouldn't make sense. Um, anyway, he's told his death scene to a tape recorder. It's locked up with his will and some other valuables and a safe deposit box. <clears throat> In the recording, he says, I, Billy Pilgrim, will die, have died, and always will die on February 13th, 1976. Then we get the description. Um, at the time of his death, he's in Chicago to address a large crowd. There's already something going on here that's very much different from the Billy that we know. There's a large crowd to see him. In other words, he's famous. He's adored. Um, his home is still in Ilium. He's going to talk about flying saucers, etc. His home is still in Ilium. He's had to cross three international boundaries in order to reach Chicago. The U.S. has been balkanized, has been divided into 20 petty nations, so it will never again be a threat to world peace. Now, <clears throat> <laughs> we have to realize that this is, well, I don't want to, let's finish the scene first, actually, before we talk about it. Yeah, Chicago has been hydrogen bombed by angry Chinamen, so it goes. It's all brand new. Billy's speaking before a capacity audience in a baseball park, so that's how famous he is. He's 
speaking to an audience that has filled the baseball park, which is covered by a geodesic dome. The flag of the country is behind him. It's a Hereford bull on a field of green. It's like a spotted cow, uh, male one. <laughs> uh, Billy predicts his own death within an hour. He laughs about it, invites the crowd to laugh with him. It's high time I was dead, he says. Many years ago, aha, we have someone else. It's Slavoljub. Hello, Slavoljub. Uh, he's still joining. You with us? Yes, uh, right, but uh, I don't know. All these... Hi, hello. Hello, hello. All right, we were just reviewing Billy's death scene and talking about it because it stands out okay. as particularly unusual. He is admired in a baseball stadium that has been filled to capacity. All these people are there to see him, and he's laughing about the fact that he's about to die. Um, he's an old man. Oh, sorry. It's high time I was dead, he says. Many years ago, a certain man promised to have me killed. He's an old man now, living not far from here. He's read all the publicity associated with my appearance, appearance uh, in your fair city. He's insane. Tonight he will keep his promise. So, uh, speaking to a large, adoring crowd, he laughs about the fact that he's going to die. The crowd protests the fact that he's about to die. So the crowd's like, boo. <laughs> we don't want you to die, Billy. We love you. So this is so contrary to Billy that we know from the story. Billy is not popular. He's not certainly not famous. Uh, I'm, you know, he's loved by a few people. Most people just don't know him. And it's not that they don't like him. Most people just don't see him as anyone in particular. <laughs> it's kind of like he sees himself most of the time. But here he does not see himself that way. Billy rebukes the crowd. If you protest... If you think that death is a terrible thing, uh, then you've not understood the word I said. Then he closes his speech, as he always does, with the words, farewell, hello, farewell, hello. <laughs> there are police around him as he leaves the stage. They're there to protect him from the crush of popularity. No threats on his life have been made since 1945. The police offer to stay with him. They are floridly willing to stand in a circle around him all night with their zap guns drawn. So... We get more of this science fiction-y edge. The police have zap guns. Uh, no, says Billy serenely, it's time for you to go home to your wives and children. It's time for me to be dead for a little while and then live again. At that moment, Billy's high forehead is in the crosshairs of a high-powered laser gun. <laughs> it's aimed at him from a darkened press box. In the next moment, Billy Pilgrim's dead, so it goes. So Billy experiences death for a while. It's simply violet light and a hum. There isn't anyone else there. Not even Billy is there. Okay. So what do we say about that? Uh, I mean, at no point in any of his memories, his time jumps, aside from this, by the way, is not a time jump. It's expressed in the story as uh, something that he has recorded. He de we don't get the time jump from our perspective, our, us the reader. We don't get that as a time jump, right? So this is fantasy. He's made this up. I mean, it's kind of got to be or something. I mean, wouldn't he at some point in the 1960s because this is 1970s, wouldn't he at least see the beginning of the breakdown of the U.S. into separate countries if it were anything real? What does it all happen at once? Uh, you see what I mean? There's no invention of laser guns in the story. <laughs> I mean, those are serious technological advances that would probably at least be mentioned. His death scene is in a completely different reality from the one he experiences, even different from his fantasy reality. Fantasy reality, okay, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> oxymoron, uh, contradicting terms, if you guys don't know that term. Oxymoron is when the two words contradict each other. <laughs> fantasy reality. <laughs> um, even in his fantasy life, this none of this is on the horizon even that we know of. So what, it, I mean, 
what does that mean for us? Well, here's what I think. <laughs> um, and how you how you can explain us uh, that uh, how to say uh, contradicting uh, direction so that with that direction is the Trophamaldurians uh, back uh, and we have uh, how to say future jump no jump but taping jump in the what is the uh, meaning of that, uh, how to say, action? Uh, this, uh, yeah. op- what is it all about? What is this, uh, how to say, uh, what the writer was uh, uh, wanted to um, emphasize with that? Um, well, if that's what I was going to uh, um, attempt. I'm going to attempt. Uh, well, I think... This is just my opinion. I don't know for sure, but um, I think we're really meant to see that this is a fan. This is, this in particular is a fantasy, and it contains things that would make him feel better. The fact that the U.S. would be broken down into smaller, less harmful countries to him is a comfort, because he was in the war and he doesn't want to be associated with a large superpower. So. Uh, it also is him dealing very straightforwardly and even happily with his own mortality, where he says, well, time for me to die. And he gets further comfort from the love of the crowd. It's one of those fantasies, you know, uh, <laughs> I guess that a person would have of being adored by the public. It's completely contrary to it. The only other time he's adored by the public is when he's adored by the Tralfamadorian public clapping for him as he takes a piss. <laughs> That's one thing that happens while he's in the zoo. He goes to the bathroom and the Tralfamadorians applaud. Woo, look at him go. <clears throat> so this is, uh, there's a bit of contrast there. Interestingly, he's in a dome in the zoo And he's in a dome here also, right? (laughs) So I don't know what to make of that, but I think, I think we're really meant to see that this scene above all is, is a fantasy. It's not now. And I want to ask you something, um, how you can explain, um, symbol of the zoo, uh, I've lost your audio. Can you guys can you guys hear me right now? It seems like I'm not making. I can hear. Yes. Oh, okay. I think her sound went bad because of the connection or something. Yeah, never know. Uh, we're not hearing you at the moment. I can see you're saying something, but there's no sound. Can you write, perhaps? <laughs> Ah, there you go. Well, it kind of. <laughs> uh, I can talk about this. I heard the part where you asked about the zoo. I can talk about that for a second because, well, um, there is a running theme about the animals. Oh, I see a chat here. Ah, oh, okay. Um, there is a running theme about the animals. Uh, if you recall, one of the only times that Billy shows any emotion is when he sympathizes with the horses, like Nietzsche. <laughs> he sees the horses that are being tortured, uh, or he realizes that the horses are being tortured, and he has this great sympathy for them. Um, I think the zoo is kind of like just another instance of being strapped in to a kind of reality that you can't do anything about. Um, you know, just like the horses were yoked to the cart, we say yoked, <laughs> yoked, <laughs> that's the verb for the yoke, it's the thing that goes over the horses. Uh, they were, you know, harnessed, yoked to that cart, and they were driven to the point of suffering, <laughs> like him. <laughs> um, this zoo, like uh, he was endeared. Yeah. There wasn't any... Uh difference for him are you saying that the zoo in trafalgar was just like earth for him i don't think that's true because he 
he says that it's in a dome and he says that all the furniture is from like a I think it says a Sears catalog, Sears Roebuck catalog. And they even put a picture of a cowboy shooting a cowboy on the television, like a paper picture. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know about that. I think that he really, he knows that he's in the zoo. The difference is that he, he likes the zoo on Trophamador because, well, the Trophamador ship, apparently, it's not the planet, um, because well, he's got a, you know, beautiful actress, like porn actress wife. <laughs> and he gets applause for doing simple things. And the aliens don't realize that he's not a fine specimen of a human being. So they think he's beautiful or, or you know, at least exemplary. <laughs> so it's his chance to be something more than he is normally on, on earth. I think that uh, in one moment they ask him, is it is he happy in turn from a girl like uh, an art? And he said, yes, he's the same or something like that. Yeah, but it, I don't know. That's kind of an open question too, because there are there seem to be clearly points in the story where he experiences dread. He experiences fear and discomfort. Uh, you know, especially around certain points in his life. Um, but even when uh, he's in the 1960s in his beautiful house, he's not happy there. Uh, it tells us that he, in the middle of the night, is creeping through the house and the dread tells him when to stop moving. So we get the idea that he's not... <laughs> totally indifferent all the time there are occasions where we hear something about his feeling of of dread <clears throat> and there are occasions where we hear something about his feeling of some contentment on this on the spaceship zoo <laughs> um and i brought this up before but you notice how the zoo is kind of like a like an adolescent fantasy <laughs> <laughs> right, but, but I, I I can uh, see that we have uh, two levels of the some kind animal um, savage uh, savage you have to say and uh, first it is the slaughterhouse when the animals mm -hmm. uh, were killed and yeah. the second is some kind of uh, imagine imagine an zoo when the animals yeah, are captured in some an animal uh, some in some kind of prison. And uh, the, uh, in the both situation with animals, the main character is uh, how say uh, uh, were, uh, was prison in the, that with animal uh, houses, uh, a zoo and the slaughterhouse, and yeah. uh, maybe some. Mm. Yeah, no, uh, that is. Uh, I think that's a, <clears throat> a pretty well, or let's say at least subtly written part of the book. It's not out front all the time, but it's always there. Yes, there, he's in a slaughterhouse. He's in a zoo. He sees the horses. Uh, I mean, clearly he is like the horses. He sympathizes with the horses. And, you know, horses, cows, <laughs> farm animals. Uh, he is definitely- And pony in this, in this uh, uh, door, door, uh, Greek, uh, how to say, and temple. Pony. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Scene about this, uh, this yeah. Uh, funny, uh, funny. He's the pony too, isn't he? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that's a little funny for us. <laughs> uh, that's true. But I, animal I in the, in that the global, on the global uh, level, it's animal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so at the very beginning, um, in, the, in the prologue, of the book, we get that uh, part of that Christmas song. Uh, the cattle are lowing, no sound does he make, the little Lord Jesus, blah, 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 blah. Um, so there, there's that. I, I don't know if I would try to co compare him to Jesus. Certainly contrast him <laughs> because he's absolutely passive in his suffering. Um, Oh, okay, that's not even a contrast. That's a comparison. He's he's but hmm, I have to think about that before I keep talking. <laughs> I have to think about that a bit more. Um, yeah, but I mean, he's in a way always in the zoo. I would say that even when he's uh, 
in his idle life in the 1960s after the war where he's relatively successful on a material level that he's even kind of in the zoo then <laughs> right uh there's all this stuff that's done for display do you remember uh, the anniversary party and um there's meant to be made a big show of him giving a ring to valencia <clears throat> So that, that's like behavior that other people were supposed to see at the party. And there's some disappointment that Billy had a, a panic attack and he went upstairs and he gave her the ring after the panic attack and not everybody got to see it. And that was part of the, that was mentioned in the story. Like it was supposed to be seen. It was supposed to be that Billy gives her the ring in front of everyone and everybody goes, oh, what a wonderful husband he is and uh, how happy they are. Isn't it wonderful? I, I think that's also kind of the zoo <laughs> for him. You know, he's doing things as a display in the same way that the Tralfamador, like the other people at the anniversary party are the Tralfamadorians. <laughs> They're there to see him put on this show where he gives a ring to his wife that it's made clear in the story. He doesn't care for her in the way that she cares for him. Um, okay, let's go on to this next question. Why is he repeatedly represented as a clown? Um, just a reminder that he was wearing a blue toga from the, the hardy British soldiers uh, stage performance of, uh, was it? Yeah, Cinderella. So he takes part of their costume. He has the blue toga <clears throat> and boots that have been painted silver. And his old jacket, he rolls into hand muffs. So his hands are wrapped up in a, in a muff. <laughs> and he looked at least 60 years old <laughs> like that. What is the point of that? To make anti-hero from him. To make what? Anti-hero. Make an anti-hero? Hmm. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> because he doesn't have any... Again, he doesn't have any goals. I don't even know if anti-hero is the right word. Just because he's so passive. I, I mean, maybe. I, there's no maybe final that... correct answer for this. Go on. Maybe that's a funny, <laughs> funny strange costume. Yeah, you know, like... Your your sound is gone again. Like a clown? Is a clown? Hmm. We've lost you, unfortunately. She can uh, send the question with message. Yes, if you if you want to type something, Nevin, it looks like she's totally frozen now. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> the second question there is, I see that you're saying something, Nevena, but unfortunately, again, there's no, there's no sound. Um, okay. The second question there, how does this differ from, uh -huh, I'm seeing some chat. Uh, <laughs> no, is it possible? And the Things are going crazy. I'm hearing multi I'm hearing you two times <laughs> now. <laughs> it's very strange. Okay, we're hearing something now. And you can hear me now? Yes. No? Yes. Okay. But uh, uh, be, a minute ago, you didn't hear me uh, anything no, no. of what I said. No, you were you were pretty frozen actually for a while. Okay. Uh, <laughs> maybe it will be better the next. Okay. Next time, I don't know if you hear me now. 
Yes, just a second. I think I have to put this young lady into the TOEFL room. Milica, are you ready to go back to the TOEFL room? Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, okay, so we can start off with uh, how this, okay, fairly obvious question. How does Billy's appearance differ from the traditional man of wartime image? Okay, it seems like a really obvious question, but I guess it's just there to kind of get us inspired. I think like the first part, like the first question has to do with the second question. Yes. The second question is the answer to the first question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't give us the why though. It gives us the what, but not the why. Well, it's an anti-war book. So Vonnegut wanted to make a book that is different from the traditional like uh, representations of, of war where we have heroes and we have brave men. He wanted to show that it's nothing glorious, as, as I think sure. he said. So that's why the, <clears throat> the main character is, a, is represented as a clown. I think that's true on a meta level. Mm. Um, but <laughs> there's more that we could say, um, I think. <clears throat> It's interesting that they add this detail about looking 60 years old, but I think that this is a, it's kind of, uh, I Maybe don't know. Maybe the I, poor ages people. <laughs> you know what, you know something I thought of, and this is me totally off track perhaps, but um, the fact that it looks like he's wearing a toga. So if you read about the children's crusade <laughs> um, and how it was an effort of the, Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> um, I don't know. That's that's me just riffing. Uh, that's not necessarily the direction I really want to go, but it just kind of occurred to me at some point. Um, yeah, you're right. On a on a meta level, of course, he's not going to be here. And it's funny because there are other sort of anti-war stories, movies, and and books in which there are dashing heroes that and, and those the efforts of those books are completely different, those stories, because they just want to show us how horrible the suffering is. <clears throat> you know, there's the dashing, honorable, uh, brave hero and his buddies, and they all, you know, experience hell and, and lose each other and lose their minds. <clears throat> and then I think, yeah, Vonnegut would say that that's that kind of gets around the point because there's still like these heroes and there's still you yeah, know, I think well, that makes a, a better point than them because yeah. he shows that like you're not even a hero you're just there and you're a child and you have to fight and you experience all of those yeah bad horrible things and you gain nothing nobody gains anything and everything is ridiculous maybe yeah yeah it's definitely uh an absurd character and <clears throat> certainly hilarious in the, the scenes in which he appears like that, that uh, doctor who approaches him in the street to say, why are you dressed like that? And he pulls out a, a ring and a piece of a denture and smiles at him like a complete lunatic. Um, yeah, that was funny. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> I love that scene. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and I guess, you know, I, 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 part of me wants to bring it around to that ch children's crusade thing again, but, you know, uh, he's wearing a costume from a sort of fairy tale, <laughs> um, I guess is my best kind of effort towards that, bringing it back to the children's crusade concept. But um, yeah, he's certainly everything that the traditional representation is not. He's not brave. Uh, he's not physically fit. <laughs> he's not even armed. <laughs> um, he's, yeah, the exact opposite. Um, okay, let's go on to another question here. Yeah, uh, we, we've actually kind of been talking about this already. I think we skipped ahead a little bit in a sense. In what ways is Billy imprisoned throughout the story? Um, well, we've talked about how he's imprisoned in the in the uh in the zoo and i just made the the point about how 
he probably feels that his life, even in his rel- relatively successful later years, he probably sees those as, as imprisonment also. Uh, in fact, his whole metaphysical existence is a prison because he jumps through time and is always at the mercy of those jumps through time. He doesn't get to choose where he goes. He doesn't get to look at the part of the mountain range like the Trophimadorians tell him that he should focus on one of the pretty parts of the mountains. Um, And of course, he's imprisoned in the slaughterhouse. Uh, I guess the only one that we didn't really get through is his childhood. There's the possibility that his father uh, was much more cruel than we realize. We only get a few glimpses of his father and we see that his father is a kind of harsh character. Um, We can think about uh, old Roland Weary also as a contrast when we think about uh, the father aspect. Because what do we learn about Roland Weary about his father? His father was also, was also cruel, right? The main difference is that Roland's father successfully transmitted his cruelty to his son. <laughs> <laughs> right. But can 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 we mention uh, this uh, scene? Where I think that uh, this was uh, Billy's father. Uh, he uh, threw uh, out him in the uh, swimming pool. Is it is it true? Is it I remember well? He you know? threw him in the swimming pool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's yes, that's yes, what um... we were talking about at the beginning. Um, because the question becomes: Was Billy always this way? Or it's like those, it's like the problem that you get in time travel stories where like uh, there are all these devices that are uh, used to try to get around cause and effect problems in time travel stories, not just this one um, where, you know, like for example, some stories would say, Oh, yeah. Well, when you changed that thing in the past, you started a new reality, a new future, but both futures exist. So there's like multiple worlds. That's one way. That's one storytelling device to get around the problem. Um, Here, (laughs) it's that chicken and egg problem again. Uh, If you guys know what I mean, like what came first, the chicken or the egg? Maybe the trauma of his. Okay, maybe he's really traveling through time. And the trauma of his wartime experience radiated back to his childhood <laughs> through time travel. Um, that doesn't really make sense either. I don't know. It's because he was clearly already traumatized in a way, but I don't know that being thrown in the pool is enough. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I, I don't know. I, I, I guess yes, I can't really judge whether being thrown in the pool is enough to make you that traumatized. But yes, but uh, uh, through all the, the novel, uh, Billy was uh, some kind of uh, uh, in some kind of imprisonment, I would say. Yeah. And uh, on the flying source in the zoo, uh, captured in the swimming pool, uh, captured in the slaughterhouse, uh, mm-hmm. uh, capturing some scenes with the famous movie star, some kind of uh, always somebody or something uh, was captured him in some kind of thing and uh, imprisoned him in some uh, uh, in imaginable places or imprisoned with uh, uh, torturing of some person persons yeah. in characters uh, uh... yeah he's always he's always captured by something and I guess mm-hmm. how can we contrast his Trafalmador Trafalmador prison what's different about that the only time he doesn't seem to be imprisoned is when he as we mentioned earlier, sneaks out to uh, the radio station. Um, What's the difference with the Trophimador prison? Well, in that prison, the Trophimadorians give him the 
the tools. <laughs> okay, that's not a good way to describe what they give. <laughs> they give him an, uh, the company and the setting to accept his imprisonment. To something like a gold cage. A golden cage, yes. Golden yeah. cage, yes. That's right. They these days it would just be an iPhone or something. <laughs> the Trophimadorians just give you an iPhone. <laughs> And that's your golden cage. Okay. Um, why might Billy not find comfort in his religion? We know that he's at least nominally Christian uh, because we get that in his war story where it says that he had uh, a weak faith in a forgiving Christ that the other soldiers would find putrid. Um, and not a weak faith, a meek faith. Uh, just to remind you guys, or maybe some of you weren't here, that's, I don't think that should be understood as he didn't have a strong faith. I think that's meant to be understood as he had a faith that was not arrogant, overbearing, and loud. <laughs> he had a subtle, quiet faith in a forgiving Christ that the other soldiers would find putrid. <clears throat> that goes out the window at some point. <laughs> and Yelena, early you were talking about the gospel from outer space. I think that question is important for this one, or that, that issue is important for this one. <clears throat> and also the story of the man who travels back to check, check Christ's heartbeat. <laughs> uh, uh, would you... Uh... I remember, but uh, exactly where he um, uh, find, found the uh, um, comfort, uh, what uh, area was the comfort area for the well, belief? It's, it's not religious, maybe it's some uh, travel um, relations, it's some imaginable space self mind. Is not, where is the comfort zone? Where is the, well, I mean, he seems to be. What is, is it? He seems to be more comfortable in his in his Trophamador Zoo. <clears throat> I mean, we get the indications that he he feels something like happiness while he's there. Um, he has he has another he has another secret family, a secret family with a with a a, a porn a porn star <laughs> on a spaceship. He has a baby up there in space. Uh, and of course, we get indications that he ignores that baby too. <laughs> but because we hear that he kind of ignores his son in the real world, um, or at least they're not close. So it's kind of funny that <laughs> he has another baby in his fantasy world, or maybe real world, who knows. He also doesn't pay attention to that baby. <laughs> so he's still kind of, anyway, I'm, I'm getting sidetracked. Um, no, I, I'm just saying like... Uh, those things, okay, the only time that his comfort is explicitly mentioned is when it's in reference to the Tralfamadorians explaining to him that there's nothing he can do um, to change his course of existence. <clears throat> that there's nothing he can do. It says he took some comfort from that. The fourth dimension that he can't even see, that's his new religion, I guess. That's his, <laughs> that's his, that's his faith, right? Because we know that he- But also, uh, but also Trafa Madurian sold uh, everything, uh, uh, see the four dimension, <laughs> uh, right. even uh, um, uh, reproduction, <laughs> if I remember exactly yes. right. Uh, Yes, there are many different rules to producing a new life because of all of the actual processes that happen in the fourth dimension uh, that we can't see. The thing is, Billy cannot see the fourth dimension. He just knows about it. And uh, that's so that's my answer to this question, because he knows about that's his religion. Now, he does find comfort in his religion. It's just that his religion has changed to Tralfamadorianism. <laughs> if I could say such a thing. 
Um, anybody else? <laughs> Uh, scientists calculated the 11 dimension until now. Yes. Yeah. So the Trophimidorians, they have to meet some other aliens who tell them about the fifth dimension and so on and so on until it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> okay. But also when, when you mentioned the religion, uh, I remind myself on this part when they, uh, the narrator, uh, was mentioned uh, this uh, torture devices from the medieval uh, when he mentioned uh, what? I, yes uh, I don't know why I related uh, with this religion but it was some kind of uh, religion it was something weird and it is, uh, maybe it's also from this religion that weirdness uh, uh, when to some kind are made and the zoo, uh, the some uh, zone, and it's just something opposite religious. It's not the I'm, so, I'm sorry, like the, the device. Something out there. Your your uh, your microphone is cra is going crazy. You don't hear me. It's something I, to I, never know. I hear. Uh, I hear okay, you, okay, but okay, it's, okay, 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 okay. Can I say something? Oh, but uh, it's. Uh, but, you have two pictures, so you must have two microphones. No, no, ah. but one, micro one microphone okay, is okay. muted. It's not that. Uh, it's you must okay. uh, okay. close one. Uh, uh, one is it's it's not that it's not from microphone. that. It, okay, 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 okay. Um, okay. that the microphone is muted on the one. Uh, yes. Okay, 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 okay. It, but that probably affects your bandwidth. That's the. Pro I think that's the problem. The bandwidth problem. And now, now, and now, is it I okay? Hear you now, now? Yeah. yeah, I heard. Yes, okay, okay. I can hear you. So you were starting to. Uh, you started to say that you remember him go talking about some other weird religion. Is that what you said? Yes. It's, uh, no, it's uh, not a weird. I don't know why I connected this uh, term religion. Mm -hmm. With uh, some kind of uh, medieval uh, devices for torturing uh, Iron ah. Maiden, and yeah, I always Maiden, yeah. make a contrast with with this. Uh, how to say religion? It's pureness, divinity, some uh, special, uh, um, unique, and uh, uh, very uh, how to say um, this. Uh, uh, Uncomfort zone with some uh, torture device, also uh, torturing the, sure. I the mean, some uh, symbols. Uh, there, there are a lot of contrasts and, one could draw with uh, people's approaches to religiosity, where uh, some folks might take a very monastic and austere view of how they should comport themselves in the world without comfort, without. Uh, without tasty foods, without, you know, warm, comfortable beds. Um, so a sort of tortured uh, existence, that's like a monastic view, right? Uh, like the monk doesn't live a life of comfort. Well, not supposed to anyway. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, Billy doesn't, Billy's certainly not comfortable except when he's in Trophamador. So I don't think I'm going anywhere productive with this because he kind of has, he has the discomfort of not being in control of his existence. I mean, we talked early on about how it almost doesn't make sense to me that he has anxiety about where he's going to show up next because he can't control it. Well, why would you have anxiety if you can't do anything to change it? It's kind of just a weird question. You would, I guess, become really... Is it an eternity to you, right? If you're slipping through time, does that mean you're sort of always experiencing that for eternity? <laughs> I mean, he knows of his death. Uh, so that if it's like an eternal recurrence, if he's just going and going and going, slipping around forever and ever, then it is a kind of very uncomfortable existence, even if he does show up sometimes in Trophamador. I think that is uh, some kind of uh, making fun with uh, Christianity because they uh, talk about uh, 
uh, eternal life. And uh, this is some kind of eternal life, but uh, you are uh, circulating in the same story yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's the eternal recurrence. And he hasn't lived a life that that he would want to repeat constantly, perhaps. Okay, let's go on to the next one here. Uh, so we're going to review the evidence that everything is the result of Billy's trauma. So um, I've kind of compiled some things here. So this is if we're going to accept the theory that everything that happens is... Uh, in his head, so to speak. Um, and there are lots of places that indicate, and I haven't listed them all here. I'm sure I've forgotten plenty of them. But uh, there's something that slips by in the very first chapter when Kurt Vonnegut is talking to us. And I don't think we ever discussed it. Um, so he brings two books with him when he goes back to Germany to visit the slaughterhouse. Um, and the second one he mentions is this Celine and his vision. Um, Celine, uh, I can't remember his first name. He's a famous author um, in real life, later a fascist. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, it says he was reading this book and it says he was a brave soldier in the First World War until his skull was cracked. After that, he couldn't sleep and there were noises in his head. He became a doctor and he treated poor people in the day daytime and wore grotesque sorry, wrote grotesque novels all night. It's interesting that uh, either he really brought this book with him or he chose to mention it uh, as, in, in either case, it can be a hint for us to, to tell us that this is purely uh, a discussion of a soldier's trauma. Um, moving on, uh, so I guess, the MacGuffin thing you were talking about earlier, this is what we're talking about here. The time he spends in the asylum with Elliot Rosewater, uh, that's where he first learns about Kilgore Trout stories. Um, by the way, this drawing is an actual drawing by Kurt Vonnegut of Kilgore Trout. <laughs> Interestingly enough, Kilgore Trout has many eyes. Um, in Vonnegut's depiction of him. <laughs> uh, but yeah, as we mentioned earlier, there, there's a lot of support for uh, Billy's fantasy world being reflections of those Kilgore Trout stories. I mean, we talked about the big board, um, the gospel from outer space, I'm trying to remember the other ones, the money tree, <laughs> that was a very short one. Um, if we um, uh, consider this uh, book as science fiction, uh, this uh, might not be only fantasy. Right. Right. That's that's what's fun about it. <laughs> I mean, it would be it would be for the worse if we were told directly the the, the answer. Right. That it's fun that you get to play with it, and that maybe it's real. I want to believe, <laughs> as was said in the old X-Files show, you really want it to be Trophimodorians, don't you? <laughs> yes. That would be much more fun. <clears throat> um, so yeah, there's that's pretty strong evidence. Um, we get other signs of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, in various places in the book. So I picked out one example. This is uh, when he was at his his ophthalmological practice, his office, a siren went off and scared him. Uh, he was expecting World War III at any time. The siren was simply announcing high noon. It was housed uh, in a cupola, like a little dome-shaped thing, at the top of a firehouse across from Billy's office. So that's a very typical sort of uh, symptom of PTSD, is that loud sounds can make a person uh, go into a state of, of terror uh, or even relive memories. Uh, he closed his eyes when he opened them. He was back in World War II. So it's like he's living the memory after hearing the loud sound of a siren. His head was on the wounded rabbi's shoulder. A German was kicking his feet, telling him to wake up. It was time to move on. Uh, 
Um, so there's that. What else have we got? Uh, we find this. Uh, this is from some official literature I found online. Uh, symptoms of PTSD. One that I picked out is emotional numbness. That's the main reason I picked this one. Billy is most certainly an emotionally numb person. He doesn't show any particular emotions except for the horse, the horses. Um, aside from that, he's sort of dead to the world in a way. Um, can we mention the, um, do you hear me now? Yes. You hear? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, can we mention the another? It's some kind of PTSD, but we have also echo echocholia, and the second uh, uh -huh. this echocholia, uh, which is all, uh, uh, which is also which was also mentioned in some kind of uh, maybe some kind of um, the second uh, of the disease uh, disease yeah. uh, after the. I don't know. I mean, I think that they was invented uh, he, he has not this diagnosis yeah that was just because Rumford wanted to dismiss what he was saying so he was like the boy has echolalia he just repeats what he hears around him because he didn't like what Billy was saying um, or he didn't like Billy at all uh, and then when Billy began talking about his experience he gave him at least a small amount of respect enough to listen to him but he found Billy's recounting of the bombing of Dresden to be uh, lacking. <laughs> he wanted Billy, I think, to be more enthusiastic about the bombing. Um, also, Billy uh, only begins telling others about his other world after his head injury from a plane crash. So yet another severe trauma that Billy has is the huge plane crash that kills everyone uh, including his father-in-law, uh, except for him. And he has a, a head injury. And they, they even think that he's comatose after that. You know, they think that, not comatose, they think that he's uh, catatonic, is that it? <laughs> they think that he's not responding because of the head injury. Uh, is it hydrotonic? Hydrotonia? Uh, what is the endetilus? Uh, uh, how to say mean? What, what are the symptoms? What is the you know the hydrotonia? What is the uh, like uh, catatonic. symptoms? Uh, uh, catatonic, like some uh, yeah. uh, unconscious uh, state of mind. Is is a catatonic state? Uh, yeah, but it turns out that was <clears throat> well. Maybe it was. Maybe he was catatonic. Maybe that's yeah. something like catatonia where he he's expressed in the story as not actually being catatonic, but everyone thought that he was because of his head injury. Uh, maybe he really was. <laughs> um, and he's retrofitting his memories with uh, being awake or something. Who knows? Anyway, these are all examples of, oh, there's more other examples of things that support the theory that it's all a delusion. The serenity prayer is found in his office and between Montana wild hacks breasts. He has that same prayer in both the fantasy world and his office. So things are constantly being reflected in his fantasy world. <clears throat> and last but not least, the future memory of his own death Seems clearly science fictional. He gets assassinated by a laser gun. <laughs> um, of course, there are plenty of other places that we could count. Yes, uh, flash forward. Which flash forward? Uh, future memories, flash forward. It's not a flash forward. It's very important. It's not. They never say it's a flash forward. He tells a tape recorder about it. <clears throat> this one is unique because it's not described as a flash forward. It's just a kind of, that's why I put in quotes, future memory, because we don't really know. It says that it's not a flash forward. All it says is that he has told Kurt, the way that it's phrased in there, it's like, he's told me that he knows 
of his death and that he's recorded it on a tape recorder and he's locked it into a uh, safe deposit box with his will and some other things. And on the tape recorder, it says, and then we get the story. So it's not a flash forward. Very flash good. forward for me is seeing the future. But it's not seeing the future. It's just his story. Do you understand? Like that's, it's important that it's and not is a it, flash is forward. It, is it this? Is it what? Like he's crazy. Is <laughs> but is it a serenity prayer? Is that uh, uh, God help me to uh, and so on to find yeah. a serenity for the? And uh, you, uh, can you explain us uh, what exactly? Uh, what exactly is serenity? What for? What is the uh, meaning? <clears throat> what is the uh, serene? What is the Okay. Serene. Okay. That is the meaning. Let's start with the adjective serene. 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 That's the adjective, and then serenity is the noun. Okay. So serene. Uh -huh. Serene means at peace, calm, uh, graceful. Oh, uh, sure. Okay. Um, that's serene. So serenity is serene. This, ser serene. That, that's serene. a state of being at peace. Um. Okay. So uh, Billy has his own sort of perverse serenity, let's say, uh, <laughs> where he's, he's serene because he has accepted the things that he cannot change, which is everything. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it has special meaning for him. Um, so yeah, Yelena, you were saying about this, it's not a flash, for it's not, it's specifically described to us as not a flash forward. It's something that it's described to us as something he has told to a tape recorder. <laughs> I mean, I think it's very important to keep that distinction alive uh, because that helps us to explain why it's so, it's different from even his other fantastic experiences. It's not even in line with his other life, right? We, I mean, if that's in the night, it's if that's in 1974 or whenever it was, we know that in the late 60s he's living as a regular optometrist. You know, uh, there's nothing about uh, the you know conflict with China or lasers or anything like that. So it's completely disjointed. That's that story of his assassination stands completely separate from everything else we've heard. And it's a story. It's not a flash forward. It's mm -hmm. you know, so I, I think that it, that's that's quite important. Okay, but yeah. Um, so the last question we're going to talk about, <laughs> in a few ways, is does Billy have moral agency? I mean, okay. First of all, do you guys know what I mean by moral agency? Uh, does he have any? moral or ethical responsibilities. <laughs> I don't know if it's a question we can really answer. I mean, I would say, <laughs> I would say if he is truly tied to the, to the train track, I put this quote from Schopenhauer, man can do what he wills, but he cannot will what he wills. <laughs> In other words, your impulses are things that you can't exactly change. You can maybe sublimate them. You can maybe push them in different directions, um, but the like primordial forces underneath, you can't really change. Um, now this is uh, an important concept even today in various places, all the way from you know, uh, neurology to psychology the philosophy, the question of whether a person is truly possessive, uh, truly possesses a, a free moral agency. Uh, I mean, if we think about Billy, this is an artist rendition of Billy as described by the Tralfamadorians. He's strapped to a cart on a train track looking through a long tube and can only see that one thing in the distance and he can't change anything. This is how it's described in the book. 
So I think it's fair to say that Billy probably doesn't have moral agency. If these things are true, he certainly doesn't. If he is truly slipping through time into things that he can't change, then, then he definitely doesn't. But the reason I bring it up is that, well, if it's true that we don't, then it's, a, it's kind of a problem for all sorts of things. Um, so there's a deterministic view that every behavior has a cause and is thus predictable. Free will is an illusion <clears throat> and our behavior is governed by internal or external forces. Um, I forgot to put the source for this. I didn't want to get, this is actually an extremely long and complicated topic where that we're not going to be able to cover completely because there's a lot of nuance. There are some people who take a compatibilist view that says that there's some sort of combination, that there is determinism, uh, but there's also free will. They can coexist, but for now, let's just <laughs> go through this. Um, and then the concept of free will says that we can have some sort of influence over things, uh, that we have a choice uh, and we're able to get to different outcomes. Uh, now, it, it bears mentioning that uh, in neurology, free will is generally considered not to exist at all, uh, that it is in fact an illusion. Um, Anybody have anything to say about that? <laughs> it's, I don't think it's something we're going to be able to resolve. Uh, but uh, I, I will uh, just add that uh, uh, God uh, said that uh, we uh, have a free will uh, to do everything if we want. Mm -hmm. But uh, even though we uh, did something, uh, it's not mean that everything is uh, for our uh for our benefit <laughs> it's sure. uh, it's not uh, everything in uh, for our uh, how to say happiness and for our health for our uh, mental state for uh, and uh, maybe uh, the billy uh, there uh, also uh, had a free will mm -hmm. but uh, sometimes he did exactly what uh, he uh, <laughs> how to say for his benefit benefit did but something in some kind of um, contra uh, position of benefit and is some uh, how to say uh, how to say amplitude or variable for for the um, his uh, uh, free will and uh, what he uh, could do and what he couldn't i don't know uh, hmm. is um, maybe uh, billy uh, didn't uh, choose only the uh, um, this uh the first state he do maybe something that he uh, couldn't uh, in that uh... well there's a lot to unpack there <laughs> um yes <laughs> because i mean yeah. i mean coming to it from a religious perspective as that's how you started uh is uh i don't know it's a completely different thing um if you're saying that there are moral injunctions and that's the issue. Like, yes, there's free will, but there are some things you shouldn't do. Um, that's one way of approaching the problem. Uh, I don't think it's going to get us to a solution either. Um, I, like, for example, okay, so one kind of compatibilist view that says that both things are true. <clears throat> Just to be clear, I, I want to make sure, like inside of determinism, you have a bunch of, you have uh, determinism that's internal that says you know things that happen to you like in, in your life your memories and so forth your experiences will determine outcomes and, and behaviors for you and then there's also external determinism that has to do with your material surroundings so it's the old nature versus nurture thing right um but if determinism is if determinism is bleh, let me see if i can talk if determinism is completely true, 100% true, then it seems very unlikely that we could have things like uh, courts and jails <laughs> and therapy. Uh, things like that seem like they would really kind of not have any point at all. 
Um, and that's the problem. I mean, the part of, of whether there is some sort of moral injunction from a higher being is a separate issue. Um, related in some ways, but what I'm saying is, regardless of the existence of, of religion, there exist things like courts where people are sentenced and decisions are made about how they will be, like if a person goes to jail, it's because they have been determined to be responsible. But if the person uh, says, but <laughs> my surroundings and my internal states have decided for me what I would do, therefore I'm not responsible. That's a huge problem for, for, for that. There must but be maybe, some. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe some people say that, uh, that the jail is not there to, to punish people, that uh, everything is deter determined, like predetermined by the neuro neurological processes in, in our bodies and the brain and our past experiences, but the, the jail is there just to prevent people from committing future crimes. I mean, people who do not believe in free will, they say that, that actually we shouldn't want to punish uh, anyone because they didn't decide to do that. It was their brain and their, I don't know, the right. way they function that made them do it. But the whole question of prevention comes into question then, because <laughs> I, like, how are you preventing anything if it's deterministic? Well, you put them in the, in the, in the jail and then they can no, get I, out. I, I get that. <laughs> yeah, I, if you, Oh, 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 you mean preventing that person, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. preventing them, N not to punish them. They say that you should have right like, it's for the it's to protect the innocent, and they shouldn't be, I don't know, beaten up or punished. It's just that we don't want them to commit further crimes. And if right. uh, you know, the psychologist sees that they are, I don't know, inherently maybe psychopaths, they don't have that uh, center for empathy in the brain or whatever. And then yeah. put them in jail just for them to, to stop doing what they were doing, not to punish them. Yeah, I yeah. Some people say that, yeah. No, actually, yeah, that, that's, I get you there. And that's, mm. there's that big, there's a huge debate about uh, retributive justice. Do you know about that? Yeah, yeah. Like that. I think many people, even if it's, uh, especially with the internet, even if, if some some person does some minor transgression, then people want to punish them. They want yeah, to yeah. make them suffer. And actually, that's not the point. The point is just like not not to let them do it again. I think. Yeah. Yeah. The psychopath uh, cannot uh, be changed. Therefore, uh, for their psychopath uh, all all their life. So that's the deterministic view. Yes. No, it's true. <laughs> Right, but that's still a deterministic view. <laughs> yeah, I agree. psychopaths are born like that and uh, die like psychopaths. That you cannot change them. So that's an example of a deterministic view. Yeah, because it's not their fault that they are psychopaths. They were born like that. They didn't. They didn't choose it. So. Yeah. The thing is, it, it rubs a lot of people the wrong way because, uh, well, there's just this. Uh, there are people who are retributive justice people who who are like, no, jail is supposed to hurt because of a, a kind of concept of philosophy that like you feel that if a person does something wrong, then something bad should happen to them. And retributive justice people, they say, we need to keep that alive in order for the universe to make sense. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's natural to feel that if somebody does us some wrong or hurts us, that we want to hurt them back or for them to suffer. Yeah, I think yeah. it's natural for human beings. But then again, if we're looking at it rationally, I think the main point is actually that we just need to prevent them for, from further yeah. doing. It's not like a rational concept. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing that <clears throat> people get it's really so natural so i don't know <laughs> people get really in a tiff about the jails in norway <laughs> how comfortable they are and like they get better play... than living in some countries <laughs> <with the freemen. laughs> they get to play video games uh, and there's a question of like if you could uh just give the the criminal uh you know a pill or like a virtual reality where they you know live in another existence and a lot of people are not cool with that no they don't get to just live in another existence <laughs> they have to suffer and i that's a i think it's a terrible just i don't know 
it's a it's a vestigial part of our brain that that wants that you know and it needs to <laughs> to i don't know I, maybe i shouldn't go on too much about that but. um so yeah i made this i made the little caption at the bottom i found this courtroom picture <laughs> why did my client do it well, approximately 13.8 billion years ago, <laughs> the Big Bang, right? See, that's a deterministic view. <laughs> okay, it was funnier when I when I thought of it. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is what we were just talking about. Uh, there are implications for taking either side of the debate. Deterministic explanations reduce individual responsibility. I mean, that, whether there are jails or not, aside from that justice argument, the assignment of blame is kind of dependent upon the, the concept of free will, responsibility, let's say. Uh, a person arrested for violent attack might plead they were not responsible. It was due to their upbringing, a bang on the head, uh, really, uh, recent relationship stress, or a psychiatric problem. In other words, the behavior was determined. Um, Clearly, a pure, pure deterministic or free will approach does not seem appropriate when studying human behavior. This is from a site. I should have sourced this. I'm sorry. I forgot to put the source in. This is from a, a psychology website. Uh, well, yeah, when studying human behavior, purely deterministic or purely free will approaches don't necessarily work out if we want to have a good picture of a human. Uh, most psychologists use the concept of free will to express the idea that behavior is not a passive reaction, but that they participated, let's say. There's a concept of you could be taken for a ride by the world. <laughs> um, uh, soft determinism would be something like saying, that's what you need to overcome. So you should take a kind of attempt to take a, a a stance to take a stand and adopt a perspective that lets you not just be taken for a ride by, by the world, by existence. Um, those internal and external deterministic factors are things that one could overcome. I, I think this is a, I don't know. I, I, I don't think Yelena would agree with that. <laughs> um, I'm sure that there are uh, examples of psychopathic cases that are absolutely in line with what Yelena was saying. Um, but I wouldn't say in every case, look, it's not my field of study. I'm not going to take a hard stance on this. <laughs> um, so yeah, soft determinism used to describe this position whereby people do have a choice but their behavior is always under some restraints. Like you get restraints from internal and external influences, things you bump up against in the world. Um, well, is there anything else we'd like to talk about? Any other comments, questions, or topics? I have put together a preliminary list of books for the next group, which will probably be in a couple of weeks because we want to promote it. I've put up a short list here. We are going to have people vote on these as part of the promotion uh, <clears throat> to decide what the next book will be. This list might expand. A couple of these actually might go we're trying to keep them around 300 pages and a couple of these are, we want them actually preferably under 200, <laughs> but I kind of expanded it to around 300 for some of these. And I don't know if I should do that just because it's hard enough to keep people for a six week group. <laughs> and uh, uh, I just want to ask, uh... Yeah, if you uh, can send us on an email this list, uh, yes. because... Uh, we're going to actually send you, we're going to do better than that. We're going to send you a form with all the books. Form, and, yes. And the, it will let, that will be a voting form. Um, so you can vote on the books. Um, so yeah, you guys will definitely be informed. Everybody who's in this group will get updates on the next group. 
and um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm more and more leaning to doing one of the, th these are actually in order of length where the crying of lot 49 is the shortest one and flush is the longest one in this list. Um, I'm considering cutting off the last three or so, even though I would love to do the man who was Thursday. Um, I'm just, the only reason is that I, in order for this to work, I need people to stick with it for the whole, <laughs> at least, uh, you know, a good group of people to stick with it through the whole thing. And if we do one of the longer ones, it's going to have to be probably eight week group instead of six week, <clears throat> maybe even nine or 10 weeks. And if everybody gets out before then, that would be a, a shame. So I try to make the books shorter so that it's less of a commitment for the people involved. Um, and we can get more discussion out of like even 10 weeks for a book, 300 pages or so is still going to be not probably enough to do, as far as I'm concerned, enough uh, discussion. Uh, the world of fantasy starts in the weakest links in the chains of logic. Yes, that's true. But the, in science fiction, sometimes they're just pushing logic to an extreme. <laughs> Speculative science fiction does that. It says, okay, let's follow this logic all the way through to some distant future. <clears throat> I think science fiction sometimes gets a bad rap. People think of science fiction as, you know, action with lasers <laughs> or something like that. Um, but there's plenty of really good philosophical and like speculative science fiction. <clears throat> I mean, this book counts as science fiction. So does a lot of Kurt Vonnegut's writing. Um, so yeah, I will send you guys updates on this and I hope to see you next time. Um, if you have any questions or if you'd like to inform me of anything, feel free to email me anytime. But until then, that is all for now. All right. Okay, uh, thank you, Jason. Thank you. I was uh, having fun in uh, one of our maybe mutual three Just sessions. one? <laughs> I th I think uh, I have had uh, this is my third session and uh, uh, all uh, your total was uh, six score. Thank you. Six uh, sessions. I think I don't know I if I counted we did, right. We did seven actually because we had seven. like the okay. session zero, five chapters, and then the final mm -hmm. session. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I well, didn't you. have time to read the, the book and uh, to discuss about but it. But you I read it before. Um, and I forgot it all, all about. <laughs> you need to slip through time to get it uh, back. Uh, because I don't know, I, I read a lot and uh, mm. uh, it was uh, like uh, literature for uh, studying uh, for faculty, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I do remember I was enjoying uh, in reading the, that. Yeah, book, I remember. Uh, about ten years ago. Oh, you're talking about your memories. <laughs> like, so, yeah, I remember uh, you enjoying. <laughs> I think uh, in my uh, final exam, I put some Vonnegut's uh, uh, in two or, th or three sentences because uh, mm -hmm. we have a lot of uh, writers uh, included uh, in the final exam and i think uh, uh, of course uh, this one of its book was one of them mm -hmm. and i put uh, about uh, three or four sentences i don't know in my uh, essay mm -hmm. in your final work yeah, yeah. <clears throat> anglo-american in anglo-american literature and uh, our main uh, topic uh, that is uh, the uh, the very core of our studying was stream of consciousness in mm -hmm. Anglo-American literature. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. And uh, did you do Allen Ginsberg in that case? <laughs> uh, I didn't uh, read Allen Ginsberg, but uh, I, was I mean that's stream of consciousness uh, writing, William, right there. <laughs> yes, yes. William Burroughs is that we? Oh, William Burroughs, of course. Yes. Ah, nice. Very nice. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And naked lunch. Yeah, the naked lunch. And, I didn't uh, include any. I, I, what about uh, Finnegan's all, Wake? A lot of. 
Oh uh, no. <laughs> I hear an oh no <laughs> from the crowd. <laughs> why, why not? Uh, I, I, uh, I don't know. I uh, uh, saw some pages of Finnegan's Wake. Uh, Finnegan's Wake is, and, is something that yes, yes. you just yes, take in like doses. Sub, <laughs> subconscious, uh, I don't know. Um, like uh, moving, uh, like uh, lo uh, logic, uh, walking uh, through the subconscious level. I don't know. Yeah, it's and, dream logic. Uh, grab the word, uh, then you write it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but listen, guys, I do have to unfortunately get mm -hmm. going here. I got to feed my little one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, it's about that time. Um, but I will keep you updated on the next group, and I hope that you will join me in the next set of discussions. All right. Okay. Thank you. Have fun. Thank you. Bye. I certainly will. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you next time. Bye bye. See you. Bye.